Good morning, everyone. Can you hear me, Jeff? I can, Dave. Excellent. Um, I just had an internet glitch, but I called in from my phone, so we're all good. Um, I wanted to um, introduce, first of all, um, this call is, is first and foremost about Path by Origin Investments. That's our proprietary um, app. That's also our investment advisory um, product that we provide at Origin. And Jeff, who I'll introduce in a moment, um, is our portfolio manager for all of our REIT blocks. Uh, in other words, our Path portfolios. Um, what's been interesting um, this year, we launched um, early in 2020. Um, and just in the last five weeks, um, we've experienced 50% growth in PATH. We've gone from 10 million to 15 million um, that's being advised on this platform. So um, we're super excited about the product um, and we think it's um, unique in its uh, ability to advise uh, people into REIT portfolios um, that we think should be a big part of your investment strategy. Um, the other thing I wanna talk about, I know this is a public, uh, webinar uh, but uh, on our public side on our path uh, portfolios but origin first and foremost is a private uh, real estate manager with a focus on multifamily and we've been doing that for 12 years um, we've invested three funds and we have two um, active open-ended funds now um, one is a qualified opportunity zone fund um, and the other is an income plus a fund that does core plus and value add multifamily investing. Um, importantly, uh, we currently own 5,000 units nationally, own and operate, um, and then we also have 1,000 in development. Um, we have people that live in all of our markets that we cover, and our first two funds, fund one and two, have been rated top decile uh, performers, uh, both of average north of 20% uh, IRRs. Um, so with that, I want to uh, shift back to our public, um, which is PATH, and introduce Jeff. Um, Jeff uh, is a true expert on read analysis uh, from the ground up. He's been doing it for over 15 years, um, and he's been at Origin, I believe, almost two years at this point. So he's been very active in constructing all of our read blocks um, that are sorted by both um, investment goal um, meaning, do you want to uh, invest in common equities with unlimited upside and return potential or preferred equities, which have much more risk mitigation, but don't have unlimited upside? Um, and we've spoken to that on some of our previous webinars, but happy to talk about that more. A um, little bit of a housekeeping. If you have questions, um, there were three that were emailed to us prior. We're going to absolutely get to those. Um, probably this entire webinar takes about 45 minutes. Um, but you can also send in your questions um, live. And so um, in the Zoom function, if you, if you go down to the Q&A portion, we're more than happy to answer all those as well. So a little bit about uh, Jeff. Um, he is a true REIT expert. I encourage all of you to try to stump Jeff today. Um, I don't think it's possible. Um, there's roughly 200 public REITs that make up the sort of US listed universe. And I know uh, from experience that he can speak um, for much longer than we have here um, on each REIT. So um, please send in anything you like. Um, we're gonna start um, because the, the, the purpose here is to talk about Q2 earnings. And um, you know, one of the things Jeff does is um, he's listening to all the earnings calls and updating our models internally on what we see going forward based on both the data they report, but also the qualitative nature of the earnings calls. And so this is much, uh, much of this is gonna be about those earnings calls, but we'll also talk uh, more broadly about some of the things we're seeing um, both from his data, but also data that um, I might see and the, and the teams that I manage might see in, in the private side. So Jeff, why don't we jump right in and uh, we'll get started with, you know, Q2 earnings and some of your macro takeaways um, that, that you found. Sure, thank you. And I, and I know that we titled this, you know, what do Q2 earnings mean for REITs? But, you know, let's back up a, a minute. I mean, this was, the second quarter was anything but a, 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 you know, a typical quarter. I mean, the U.S. saw a GDP drop, what, you know, 32% in the quarter. You know, many, many property types were, were still forcibly shut down 
uh, through the quarter. I mean, really the reopening started to happen during the quarter. So, so in some sense, it's, it's much less on, you know, what actually happened during the quarter and, and more about how things look going forward. I mean, you know, one thing you most certainly cannot do is take, you know, any of the numbers that the REITs reported during the quarter and extrapolate that for the rest of this year, for the rest of the, the next year. I mean, there's just way too much noise when, you know, many property types were shut down. I mean, hotels, you know, virt virtually empty. That doesn't mean that hotels are never going to see uh, demand again, uh, but it, it just means we really had an all oddball quarter. But, you know, there were some, some common trends that, you know, we did see uh, uh, across the REITs. Uh, you know, for example, you know, expenses were up, whether it's extra cleaning, whether PPE, um, property taxes. You know, nobody's getting a break on, on their property taxes. You know, not, not this year, probably not next year. So almost regardless of, of property type, your expenses were up. Now, you know, REITs cut as, as much as the variable expenses as they could. Um, you know, any non-essential personnel that weren't needed, you know, for instance, at the hotels, extra cleaning people, extra, you know, uh, bellhops or, or desk staff, I mean, they, they, they were sent home. The same with security guards and, and whatnot. Granted, I mean, if you were in an area uh, that was seeing protests or, or, or riots, maybe, maybe you had extra expenses on, on the security side, but, but expenses were up. Uh, rent trends, I'm going to share a screen here, and, and this comes from uh, Mary. But this will show you, if I can find it here, where is it? That, uh, you know, we mentioned this, I think, on our last uh, webinar, that, you know, we expected uh, rent collection to, to improve uh, off of June. And, and you can see here that, you know, really across the board, uh, you know, the rent collections did get better in July and, and are, you know, coming in even better yet in, in August. So. Uh, they just continue to, be, to, to, to improve. And some of that is, you know, properties are now open. You don't have any excuse to, to not pay your rent uh, if you're operating your, your property. Um, California had some unique issues. I mean, statewide moratorium on, on evictions, you know, not just for apartments, but across all property types. Didn't matter if it was a, a mall, a shopping center, you know, a, a healthcare facility or, or whatnot, you, you couldn't evict your, your tenants during the quarter. So that meant, you know, many tenants uh, you know, didn't pay their rent because they knew they couldn't be uh, evicted. And I believe there were a lot of, uh, you know, deferrals on, on late fees and, and such. So, so California had some of its uh, uh, own issues. But, you know, in general, we are seeing rent collections uh, improve. And, you know, there were a lot of questions about uh, accounting questions, which, you know, is, is kind of atypical unless there's a rules change in, in a given quarter. Uh, but, you know, many of the analysts wanted to know, all right, how are you accounting for your bad debt? How are you accounting for these deferrals? Do you expect to get any of this revenue that you didn't get during the quarter uh, in the future? And, and you know, what proportion of it do you think you, you will get? So, I mean, it was anything but the, the typical quarter. Um, so, you know, really the bulk of the information, you know, gained was from management's discussion on, you know, what's starting to happen in the third quarter, their outlook for the rest of the year, and, you know, when they think they can get back to, uh, you know, pre-pandemic uh, uh, type demand. So I, I think that's kind of it in generalities. Uh, Dave, you ready to jump into, into some of the individual sectors, or do you have any questions? Um, I would just add that, um, like I said before, since we have 5,000 units and another 1,000 in development, we have our own data set. Um, and in multifamily, it's amazing how much the data Jeff is um, reporting in collections is corroborated by what we own. And so we're literally coming in at 95, 96. It's exactly what he's reporting. Um, the other thing that's interesting is um, it's not trending lower um, really in any asset class. And so that was kind of the worry is that it would get worse and worse as the pandemic um, kept, you know, uh, extending in length. That's not the case. Um, however, unemployment benefits um, expired in, at the end of July. And so, it, you know, it'll be really interesting to see what happens in September, October, as that becomes more of reality. I know that there was a um, executive order that reinstated some elements of them. But the reality is an executive order isn't a congressional approval and they don't behave the same way. Um, and so it, it's more likely that um, the unemployment benefits that were 
helping a segment of the renter base um, will be less and less available. And so we'll see what happens with collections going forward. And, and candidly, Jeff, that's what's um, affecting not only uh, a lot of the, the real estate, the publicly traded real estate, but also banks. Uh, because there's a concern in the public markets about that, um, and we can we can talk about that a little bit. Um, why don't you, you know, since we're talking about multifamily, um, we'll, we'll segue into sector by sector earnings and what you you know learn from these calls. But maybe we can start with multifamily since we just sort of sort of launched into that. Sure. So. Just to keep us on, on track here, here's a list of the sectors that we're going to cover. You know, we're really, we're only going to have a few minutes to spend on uh, on each one of these. These are you know, more or less ranked in the order of in improving uh, or, or you know positive fundamentals. Uh, you know, with obviously with lodging or hotels performing the worst, and we'll work our way up to, to data centers. But you know, you know, really starting with the the apartments, like uh, you know Dave mentioned. Um, you know, rents were for the most part down. I think there was more rent pressure on the coast. I mean, three markets in particular, uh, New York City, San Francisco, and, and Los Angeles, uh, you know, really saw the, the asking rents uh, go down. So if you had to relent a, a vacant unit, you were going to get less than what the previous tenant was paying. Um, you know, Sunbelt markets seemed to hold up better. Uh, and then also, I think suburban assets seem to do better than, you know, or, you know the urban uh, high-rise uh, apartments, if you will. I mean, this, a lot of this shouldn't come as a surprise. Uh, you know, during, during the lockdown, I think a lot of people got a little bit of, of cabin fever, uh, you know, didn't, you know, couldn't leave their building without going down a, a, an elevator, you know, shared with, uh, with other people. And so, you know, think more like garden-style units where you've got your own uh, entrance and, and exit uh, of your unit, you know, those seem to hold up a little bit better than, than before. I mean, you know, housing isn't a necessity. I mean, it's, it's usually going to be one of the first bills that the, the, the people pay, uh, you know, unless you live in California where they couldn't uh, evict you. So, I mean, rent collections, you know, while they're getting better, they, they were relatively high uh, uh, throughout. Um, but, you know, Dave already mentioned, you know, what happens uh, now that that federal, that extra federal $600 uh, a week of uh, unemployment is gone, uh, you know, will that be replaced with a you know, smaller portion? And, you know, at least from the REITs who, who typically own, you know, better portfolios, the idea is that that's really going to hit the, the, the lower income or the class C uh, apartments the most. Uh, you know, for the most part, many of the REITs uh, own, you know, luxury type apartments. The renter is a, is a renter by choice meaning that they have the means, they have the extra cash in the bank to continue paying their rent. Um, so, you know, non-collections weren't really an issue ago, but there could be some pressure on, on the Class C. Um, you know, we've seen a, a, a kind of a pickup in development activity. I know, Dave, we've got several projects, uh, you know, underway. I don't know if you want to mention anything about uh, read apartment development trends right now. Well, I can speak to our portfolio, but on the public side, I'd be interested in knowing more about their pipelines and maybe the, the, the people on the call would as well. But I mean, for us, um, we've seen uh, broadly effective rents and effective rents are both the face rent and concessions. Um, that's what creates an effective rent. Effective rents are anywhere from unchanged in strong markets, meaning they're the same as they were pre-COVID. Um, I would characterize strong markets as um, the Southeast, um, some areas of Texas, Nashville, Denver, Phoenix. These are stronger markets. Um, the coasts are, are very, very weak. So San Francisco, LA, New York, Boston, um, extraordinarily weak. So you're, you're talking about um, anywhere from 10 to 16% declines in effective rents. That doesn't mean that that's enduring. I mean, a lot of that is um, free rent meaning you sign a lease, you give away two months of free rent. And that's probably short term in nature. Um, so I wouldn't extrapolate that out and say, wow, you know, now it's 16% lower. It can come back too, but they're really getting hit on the coast and, and the public markets are reflective of that. So REITs with large exposures to California and New York are down 30, 40, 50% more 
than REITs that don't have it, right? So uh, if you take a apartment REIT like Camden, for example, um, Southeast and Texas portfolio, um, maybe they're down 20%. And then you take a REIT like Equity Residential, you know, it's down 35%, right? So the market's pretty efficient at picking these things up. And then of course, Jeff's job is to figure out based on how much the correction is, what's the better opportunity, right? Because buying equity residential down 35%, you know, so you're essentially buying 2015 levels in, in the stock. Um, maybe you need to take a hard look at that and start thinking about what two years, three years, five years out looks like, um, do people, when the world normalizes, do they actually want to live in New York City and LA and San Fran? Or do you think that this is a permanent shift in demand? And these are the types of things that, that we need to think about. And, and, you know, the REITs, most of them have been winding down the development pipelines over the past year. I mean, multifamily deliveries, have, you know, they've been elevated for a while. So many of them have been winding down. One of the apartment REITs I, I do like is Avalon Bay, and they do have some of that uh, uh, coastal exposure, and, and they have been hit harder than, than some of the Sunbelt uh, owning REITs. Uh, but you, you really now you can get them at a good discount. They do have an active development pipeline. Um, you know, some of this stuff was started late last year or early this year before the pandemic. And their take on it now is, well, it, it's going to be two years until we deliver these. We will de be delivering these on the backside of this recession. We're going to be, you know, one of the first and if not the only player, uh, you know, with new supply, new product coming out of this recession. And so it, it's not like they have to lease these up now or later this year, but rather they can continue on their development process and be ready to go when, when we're in a better market. Yeah, and I would look for public REITs. I mean, you, you want, if you were looking to buy a public partner REIT, you want them to have a vibrant and defensible development pipeline because that's their highest margin part of the portfolio. I mean, when we develop on the private side as origin and, and we develop a lot, you know, we're looking at 30% margins in order to, to, to compel us to start the development. And so if we're doing a hundred million dollar development, I mean, think about how much money, how much profit is being generated with 30% margin. Public REITs are no different. They need those margins to drive earnings, which ultimately drive a stock value for shareholders. And so be careful what you wish for, right? In a time that seems uncertain, if you, if you say, well, I really wanna be in, in, in companies that take no risk, that's not a strategy for long-term growth. I mean, you have to continue to invest and try to build value for shareholders, whether you're public or private. All right, so moving on. So now we got apartments roughly kind of in the middle of our list. We're going to start with uh, uh, lodging and, and you know, work our way uh, into the sectors that have you know, better uh, fundamentals. So, I mean, lodging, they're still operating at, at relatively low, low, low occupancies. I mean, for the most part, hotels have opened back up. I mean, I think if you went across the re universe, maybe 90% of the hotels are now open. But they're not open entirely. They may only have some floors. You know, let's say you have a 10 story high rise, you know, maybe you've shut down floors five through 10 and you're only operating on, on the first four floors. I, I mean, the, the numbers coming out of these, these lodging REITs are, are, are just dismal. I mean, right now the hottest metric uh, when talking about uh, hotels is how many months of cash burn you have. And it can range from, you know, as long as two to three years of cash down to, you know, less than a year worth of cash. I mean, they, they need some, some help. Every single one of the lodging REITs has, has cut their dividend uh, or suspended it uh, at this year. In, in fact, you're seeing like crazy numbers on, on a few hotels that, that trade, uh, you know, cap rates that are like 0.6%, 0.5% which by itself is, is, is really a meaningless number. You need to look at something else, replacement cost or cost per key. It's just the NOI is so low, if not negative at, at these hotels. Uh, it, it's just really you know, putting in some, some strange numbers. The hotels that are doing better are, are more of the limited service, 
uh, or, or, or resorts that are in drive-to locations. I think we've talked uh, before about how vacations uh, you know, this summer were predominantly uh, drive-to. Uh, you know, what, what is gonna lag is, is group bookings. I, I know one of the REITs mentioned that they've had the same group, some of the same group bookings you know, canceled and rescheduled you know, three or four times now. People just aren't sure when the, the group bookings uh, are going to come back, you know, bi business travel. So, I mean, I, I know us at Origin, have Dave, have we done much traveling on a, on a business uh, basis this, this year since the pandemic? No, we haven't. And uh, what's interesting is the longer it extends, the more businesses are realizing that they don't need it as much. Now, we do because I, I need to physically see buildings. But there's an awful lot of travel that isn't essential, even at Origin. And so you're reevaluating that when you can have a high quality meeting with a client um, or a partner, you know, on Zoom like we're doing now. And so th there's there's long term considerations. It's not just there's going to be a vaccine and everything's normal. You know, there's a new entrant into both the office space and the business travel space, and their name is Microsoft, and they're here to disrupt. And they have a lot of money and they're gonna keep getting better and better and better. They'll probably buy Zoom at some point, is my guess, um, or try to drive them out of business, right? That, that those are the two things they do. And, and you know, here we are. I mean, like, I don't think that office owners, airlines, and hotels understand what's coming. I don't think that, you know, that's my opinion. That's not even Jeff's, and it's certainly not from earnings calls, but my opinion is there's a new entrant to the space they're highly capitalized, they're very good, and they're gonna disrupt the hell out of everything. Next up, we're gonna talk about malls. And again, this is, a, this is another sector that is, uh, that is not you know, doing well. Most malls have opened back up. You know, most of them did open up during the second quarter. There are a handful in California or in the New York City uh, boroughs that, that are still closed. Uh, but for the most part, they are, they have opened, and we saw earlier that rents, you know, rent collections are improving. It, it's a lot harder to say you're not going to pay your rent when you, your store is, is open, but you've still got some big lawsuits to be settled. You know, uh, Simon Mall Group, uh, is, Simon Properties Group is is being sued by the Gap not to pay their rent. Simon's Counter suing Gap. Some of this is going to have to be settled in a in, in a legal manner to find out what's going on. But you know what really concerns me is the is the pace of of, of retail bankruptcies. Um, you know there were a lot of retails on on the verge before the pandemic, but you know I think we've had like a major chain bankruptcy. You know al almost every week since the pandemic began. I mean J C Penney's looks like the the, the lenders are going to take over. Uh, Lord and Taylor, Neiman Marcus, Brooks Brothers, Asina. That's that's the owner of Ann Taylor, Lane Bryant, and Justice. J. Crew, Lucky Brand Jeans, Ben Warehouse in bankruptcy again. California Pizza Kitchen, GNC. I mean, there, there's just an endless list of, of, of retailers that have gone bankrupt. And, you know, many of these are the the the, the big boxes, the anchor boxes uh, at, at the mall, uh, but it's a lot of the small shop space uh, as well too. I mean, mall occupancy is, is heading lower. Uh, the owners are having to get creative on what they do with the mall. Everyone's probably seen that. There was an article out where, uh, you know, some of the malls are renting their parking lot to drive in movie theater operators. They come out, they set up a screen, people can drive up and, and watch movies. I mean, that's a non-traditional mall use. I mean, it's helping them bridge the gap, but uh, it's, it, the malls just aren't in a good place. And it's not just that these, you know, tenants are going bankrupt, but leasing is down too. Tenants aren't opening new stores, or even the retailers that are going to survive. They're 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 you know they're uh, they're shutting down stores. So um, it's actually very likely that we're going to see one of the mall REITs uh, file bankruptcy in, in, within the next few REITs. Uh, CBL, uh, one of the mall REITs that you know we don't own in, in any of our strategies, uh, is is working on a prepackaged bankruptcy right now, where the lenders are going to take over. It sounds like roughly ninety percent of the equity. And and there's some other mall REITs behind them that may not survive the year or may not survive 2021 a, 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 as well. I mean, I, if you had to pick a mall REIT, you know, I would go with Simon Property Group. They're likely to be the consolidator. Uh, they have the balance sheet to to weather this storm. Um, 
There are still some issues with their with their uh, earlier announced merger with Talman. Um, Simon wants out of it. Talman wants to consummate the deal. That's likely going to be be settled in in court. But you know, malls are just not coming from a, a place of strength. Moving on to shopping centers, I mean, they suffer from some of the same maladies. I mean, they they do share some of the tenants, uh, but they are doing better than the malls for sure. I mean, grocery stores or you know other essential services, you know, those are doing fine. Really, haven't skipped a beat. Hey, you know, if you got a, a pizza carryout or a pizza delivery uh, business in your in your strip center, uh, you know, that's probably doing fine. Or any sort of restaurant that has delivery uh, or, or carryout, you know, more of the sit down is is what's struggling. Um, but there, there's a lot of issues with the mom and pop stores that you know they they were using their life savings to open this business. They didn't have a lot of savings put behind that, and if they had to close down, uh, you know they weren't going to make it. You know, think think of the nail salon where you've got the the independent contractors working for, uh, you know, the the owner of of the place, and if you can't physically have your clients come in to do, uh, you know, those kind of services, I mean, it, it, it's not good. Rent collections are trending better. Um, and, and you know, this was probably the group that had the most questions, uh, accounting questions on it. what's the what's the accounting treatment for the unpaid or the deferred uh, uh, rent. So you know, doing better than malls, but you know, again, you know, e-commerce e is taking away from the, the bricks and and, and mortar. Uh, another group that's you know, that's kind of got some big question marks is is office. Um, office leases are traditionally long, they could be five or 10 years, and most of the tenants are paying. The, the rent collection numbers have held up. But I mean, really the question I think people have is what's the long-term use gonna be? And right now there's some competing dynamics. Uh, in in one, one hand, you know, we do have people working from home and that seems more uh, acceptable today and maybe a long-term trend. We've seen some tech firms or some firms announce that they're going to stay that way. But on the other hand, you know, it seems that people do want to go back to the office. And when they do go back, they need more space. You know, one of the trends that we saw over the last decade was the densification, putting more people in less space in offices. And, and that, that bench style format, like, isn't going to work anymore. You, you, you can't be hand to hand, cheek to cheek with, with your coworkers. We all know that we've got to keep six feet apart or, or, or more. Uh, people don't, don't seem to be buying into the, the hoteling concept where they go into work and they can sit anywhere they want. People kind of like to have their own dedicated space. So for those that are gonna use the office, we need more, more space uh, for those employees, but maybe we have less employees there. Does it net out to zero or is it a negative or positive? I think that's, that's going to take some time to, to, to figure out. I know, Dave, we, we have owned some um, office buildings in the, on the past on the private side, and you know, we, we are a, a, a renter and an office using company. I mean, do you have any uh, ideas on where you think the future of office is headed? Yeah, I do. I'll just be brief. Um, I think there's a permanent subset of office demand that's going to be filled by the virtual. And so, you have a new entrant, it's Microsoft, it's Cisco, it's Zoom, and they're gonna, they're an inferior product. It's not as good as working physically together, but they're good enough. And classic disruption almost always happens from an inferior product that's just way cheaper. So think about from a business owner standpoint, how much cheaper it is to operate virtually versus physical space. You're saving millions of dollars a year. And then think about how much cheaper it is in terms of time and convenience for the labor to stay at home and work. They don't have to commute. They don't have, I mean, you're talking about enormous savings in time and money there too. So it, it's going to take a segment and it'll grow. What, what's interesting about retail sales, think about all the bankruptcy Jeff mentioned. So there's, there's massive disruption. And on the other side of that, you have Amazon just to hold up one, that's a $1.6 trillion market cap and so in a way it's 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 subsumed all of these businesses into this you know it's zero sum like they're huge because everyone else is gone well retail sales is is still less than 15 percent online so think think about how small like went from zero to 15 i get it but think about all the disruption that only happened zero to 15. i think that's coming in office 
it, it does my point is it doesn't take a lot. So moving on to the freestanding or the net least assets. And you know, really this this is gonna vary based on you know what type of properties and, and tenants you have. I mean, if, if all you had was Walmart as a tenant, you're like, you know, what's the what's the problem? They're they're open, they're they're paying rent. If all you had was movie theaters, then you've got a big problem because they were closed down. Now, now the issue is none of the net least REITs, you know, really are all Walmarts or all movie theaters. They're they're a, a hodgepodge of, of things. You really got to look at the underlying tenants and were they essentials that were open and had good credit and continue to pay, uh, or or were they smaller? Where there's you know there's some furniture stores that have filed bankruptcy. So I mean, it really depends on the type of properties you own. If you had some net lease office or industrial into your mix, those generally did better than, than the retailers. Um, so it really depends on the type of tenant and the type of, of credit that you have. Um, you know, rent collections, again, those, those are trending better. Um, and we're starting to see them do acquisitions again. I mean, some of them still have a favorable, favorable cost of capital. In fact, a few of them got some really nice deals done in the second quarter, and they made the point out to say, hey, we're not always going to be able to buy stuff at an eight and nine cap. This is kind of one time we had some people panic and we were willing to step up and do these deals that we would have done anyway. So uh, that is getting to be a mixed bag. It just depends on, on what you own. Yeah. And I'll add a couple more things about office. Um, if, if the office building feels like a single tenant credit, right, those are trading at extraordinarily high prices because if you have, since I mentioned Microsoft earlier, if you have Microsoft or Google as your tenant and it's a 10 year lease, it's essentially a bond. And if you're able to, you know, you can probably sell that at a five cap or less because you're selling their credit, right? That's a contractual payment for 10 years on something that's definitely going to pay. And the risk free rate is, you know, as of this morning is 0.7, right? That's the 10 year note yield U S treasury. So that's a massive spread to the risk-free rate. And it's also a, a decent spread to their own corporate bonds. And so typically in real estate, when you're talking about single credit, you look at their corporate bonds of similar duration, and then there needs to be a spread for liquidity because real estate isn't a bond. You can't just sell it that day. It takes time to sell a piece of real estate, even with that credit in it. But we own some of those buildings with single credit and they're doing very, very well. But when I'm talking about office, I'm talking about a large office building that has 20 tenants and they're multi-credit buildings and they're multi-lease buildings. You know, Jeff mentioned most of the leases are five and 10 years. That's true. But at every given point, you might have leases that expire next year, the next year, the next year. So it's this constant roll of, of, of tenants. And so then you have to ask the question, is there going to be demand to backfill that tenant and replace that income stream? So that's one point. The other point is creative office um, is faring much better than commoditized office um, for a couple of reasons. Um, one, it has the cool wow factor and a lot of the technology firms and creative firms and even traditional uh, consumers of um, normal office products have moved into that demand segment. They, they, they want to be in the, you know, high ceiling, cool timber exposed, uh, you know, concrete and steel type, type feel. Um, the other reason is creative office tends to not have elevators. And so from a safety standpoint, you know, people are more interested in that too, because they, they tend to be single story, no elevator, more space, more air volume buildings. Um, on our private side, we have a combination of single tenant and uh, a fairly large portfolio of creative office. So we're much more insulated than, for example, if you had um, a lot of high rise buildings in, you know, I mean, I'll make it worst case in New York City, right? Because now you have elevator buildings or commoditized pretty high rents and people are leaving New York. Um, for, for reasons, you know, they want to be in less dense areas. Yeah, that's a great, great observation. Uh, moving on to, to self storage, um, you know, so self storage during the quarter, I mean, there, there was weakness in rent. 
um, the street rates were, were down, you could get a better deal. Um, uh, occupancy held up, but it was, it was somewhat artificially in, inflated. I mean, one of the issues that the storage REITs had was uh, that they couldn't hold the option of the defaulted units. I don't know. I don't really watch storage wars, but you know, I understand the, the gist of it, and I understand the process of, of what happens if you don't pay your uh, self-storage fees for too many months. Uh, that you know they will padlock it and eventually they will auction off the, the items inside. Well, when you couldn't have groups of people, uh, that prevented them from one, auctioning off those units and collecting that revenue. And two, it, it prevented them from releasing that unit to a new tenant that had the, the ability to pay. So there, there was obviously some disruption. However, in, into July and, and even more so into August, we did start to see rent growth again in the self storage. And, and self storage is, is really it's a property type uh, that does well when there's you know certain types of uh, activity by uh, you know, U.S. Uh, uh, citizens or folks. I mean, you know, one of them is is moving. If you're moving from an apartment to another apartment, apartment to a house, house to an apartment, um, a, any which direction, there's often a, a need for temporary storage, and that's where self storage uh, comes in. Uh, other life events such as marriage or divorce or having a baby can lead to the demand can lead to the demand in uh, self storage units. You need more space to put that baby crib in. Uh, so you know a lot of that activity got put on pause during the pandemic. Maybe, you know maybe not having babies, uh, but you know the, uh, clearly marriages were were, were delayed. Uh, moving was delayed. But you know now that we're seeing strength in the U.S. housing market. I, I would expect self storage activity to, to, to pick up. Tenants are really sticky. For I mean, in most cases, you know, they, they set up their payment to hit their uh, credit card every month, and and they just forget about it. Uh, and then the storage company sends out a rent increase every five or six months, and you know, they make it just enough to be annoying, but not enough that you want to go down and haul out of your stuff out. Of so, uh, you know, self storage had a rough quarter, but but things are improving, and and really, it, it will continue to improve if we see strength, uh, continue strength in the U.S. housing market. Moving on to healthcare, you know, healthcare is kind of a mixed bag. They're, they're kind of in the in the middle here. Um, I mean, in the, they're in the middle, but there are certain property types that were doing well within healthcare, and certain property types that were not. Uh, for instance, senior housing. Uh, you know, was not doing well, um, and especially in the cases where there was a Radea structure or where the REIT took on uh, the operational risk. Um, I mean, you you have occupancies that are still falling. I mean, they were falling dramatically April, May, and they're starting. They're still falling, but they're they're it, it's they're falling less. I mean, the, the issue is uh, some of these people in these senior housing facilities were, were, were you know, moving out or you know, passing away, and then they were limited with the tours that they could do to bring in new tenants. Or you know, people say, hey, I, I don't want to put grandma or grandpa in a senior housing with COVID running around. Well, they can just live here for another six months or, or a year, maybe forever. So, I mean, senior housing uh, it has done really, it's, it was really bad. It's really scary. Uh, but it seems like it, it, they're they're stemming the bleeding, and ultimately, with with the growth of the baby boomers re retiring, which isn't expected to, to peak for you know three four years, you, you should see a pickup in in activity. Um, you know, skilled but nursing. Jeff, Jeff, the uh, the senior housing, a lot of them are they're not accepting new people. Period. So, yes. so not only can't you visit, but you also can't have mom or dad or grandma or grandma they actually can't enter um and that's that's the interesting point right so you have to have an opinion and i'll, I'll just make it about you what's your opinion so here we are in covid they're talking about potentially a vaccine being at least available by november december of this year not to the general public but approved you know the, the phase three approved and, and potentially being available, I would say, probably Q2 um, to Q3 of next year for people, right? And, and so if you're looking at a, a senior housing uh, stock or a healthcare stock that has a lot of exposure, we're talking about stocks that are really, really beaten up, right? 
So what, what is your opinion based on a normalization? I agree with you. I mean, the, the demographic trends haven't changed. Yeah. It, right? So is this an opportunity? It, uh, yeah, I think it is an opportunity. I mean, they are they are well off their low, but I mean, it's, yeah, many of the senior housing operators or, you know, particularly the big three REITs of you know, Well Tower, Health Peak, and, and Ventos, I mean, they're, they're trading at substantial discounts to, to net asset value. Uh, oh. where they've traditionally traded at a, a premium. I mean, don't get me wrong, they've got some things to work through. Um, there, I mean, one of the questions out there is, are they going to have uh, liability for deaths that occurred uh, via COVID patients in, in their units, or will they be uh, immune to that? So, I mean, you know, what comes out of these lawsuits is, is giving people some pause. But yeah, I think actually for the long term, there, there's some great buys out there right now. Yeah, and, and where's Ventas, just for example, where is that trading right now? 40, 42, 40, yeah, 41, okay. 42 dollars. So I believe their low was 20, right? So it, it's doubled off its low, number no, one. No, March 19th, March 19th, I, they, were, they were closer to 13. I almost fell out of my chair on that one. Yeah, so, so well, I mean, it, it's massively off its low, but at the beginning of the year, it was probably trading in the 60s, is that right? Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, these stocks are, it's indicative of a lot of these sectors. I mean, we talked about equity residential briefly, but, you know, ESS is another one, Avalon Bay is another one. You know, companies, residential, high quality REITs, um, and these are in our portfolios. Again, we're not stock pickers. We, we're managers of REIT blocks, but we have to follow each individual stock to do this. But these stocks, you know, they're, they're even lower. I mean, like, think about at least Ventos has doubled off its low. I believe the low in equity residential was, um, you know, currently it's trading 55 today. I think the low is 52. And if I'm wrong, it was 51. I mean, they just haven't bounced, you know, and, and they're still sitting down 35%. And, and candidly, I don't get it uh, because we own, an, you know, an awful lot of, uh, apartments in the private sector and the private markets are not lower they're not lower at all and, and in the beginning i didn't really trust it because there was only a few sales to point to now i can point to dozens and dozens of sales all trading at you know four caps four two caps four three caps the implicit cap rate on these public uh, apartment rates is way north of five you know so it, it Something's wrong here. Doesn't make sense. Mm -hmm. Continuing on on healthcare, I mean, other property types within healthcare, for example, skilled uh, skilled nursing, uh, you know, still had some lumps, but wasn't nearly as bad as, as senior housing. I mean, you know, part of the reason for that is skilled nursing is much more dependent on government pay, whether it be Medicare or Medicaid, versus the senior housing that's a hundred, you know, almost a hundred percent private pay. You know, skilled nursing did benefit from some of the CARES Act. And in some cases, you know, ho hospitals were, you know, essentially cleared out, sent these people to uh, rehab centers or skilled nursing facilities because they wanted to, you know, one, not ho house uh, these sort of patients uh, around COVID cases coming in, and two, they thought they would need the, uh, the extra beds for, for COVID cases. Uh, that, that's hospitals. Um, hospitals... Most of the healthcare systems are in good financial spot. There, there are some that are, you know, on the verge of bankruptcy or, or have filed. But you know, most of the hospital systems, healthcare systems that the REITs work with are, are in better shape. Uh, hospitals are now back open doing elective surgeries, and in many cases, elective surgery doesn't just mean something that you want to have done. It means it's something you need to have done, but you have control over when it gets done. Can it be done in a month, three months, or six months? So there's actually kind of a backlog in many cases for these elective surgeries. And some of these hospitals you know, work in seven days a week to try and get you know, as many of these elective surgeries in and out. And, and there's still more to go. Uh, hey, hey, Jeff, I, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna cut this off because we have too many questions and I have a hard stop at noon. I think other people do too, but I just can't stay on past noon. So I'm gonna move to questions. We didn't cover, by the way, Timber Towers industrial and data we, and there's it was just too ambitious we have too much yeah. to cover 
And, and, and I can do those in 30 seconds. I mean, manufactured housing, single family rentals are great. Single family rentals, rents are actually went up in the, in, during the second quarter. That is, there was more demand than before the pandemic. Timber, lumber prices and, and OSB, oriented strand boards are hitting all time record highs. Power, they expect to see acceleration of, of uh, activity in the second quarter. A lot of that relates to T-Mobile and, and Sprint. Industrial, demand was pulled forward. Not just next quarter's demand, but years worth of demand pulled into this year uh, due to, to e-commerce and you know, needing to have the space to, to fulfill these orders. And, and data centers, I mean, it's just record quarter of leasings for some of those REITs. Uh, again, e-commerce driven, these Zoom meetings, e-learning, uh, you know, things that aren't even here yet uh, to a full degree, autonomous vehicles, uh, virtual reality, uh, you know, more is coming. So you know, really in these last sectors that we're going through quickly, de demand is strong and, and they, they, they really are in a good position going forward. And what's happening in Towers Industrial and Data Center is not only is there a ton of demand, but the credits of that demand keeps getting better and better and better. And so you're, 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 you're winning twice and the cap rates are compressing both based on demand and the quality of the credit of the companies that comprise the demand. And so it's a pretty powerful, and I don't know if we have this slide, Jeff, but the kind of winners and losers of not just COVID, but the last few years, do we have that slide in this deck? No, no. So I'll, I'll just speak to it, but like, for example, our technology REIT block, which we have on our path by origin um, app. What was the return in 2019? Let, let's talk about pre-COVID. So, so in 2019, COVID's not around. What did that return last year? Gosh, it was 40 plus percent. I'm, uh, the, the actual number's fading me, but I want to say it's 42%. Okay, so there's a 42%, and that's just based on the economy changing, right? And and the, the sort of the Amazons and, and all that concern, they, they, need, they need technology, they need towers and they need data centers and they need industrial to, to execute their business. And so that's what's happening there. So, so what happened now there's COVID, it's 2020. What happened in our tech block this year? Oh, they're, they're up 16, you know, 16, 17% year to date. I think that was through, through Friday. You're doing even better than the yeah. S&P 500. So, so let's just, finish the, the, the conversation. What happened in retail in 2019? And, and you can talk about malls and you can talk about shopping centers or both, but like what happened in retail in 2019? You know, they were down. There, there were questions on uh, about malls and, and tenant demand going forward. So they were down 20%. I mean, they, they got More. annihilated, 20%, yeah. 25%. And then obviously what happened this year with COVID? They're annihilated again, right? So, so what's happened in REITs, you know, if you look at a growth REIT um, index, right, or a, a block, our growth REIT block, you're going to get representation of all sectors that Jeff is pointing out. And we as a manager will overweight in the sectors that we like more and underweight in the sectors we like less. And that's a function of growth and the price of the stock, what we've been talking about. But generally, you know, you're going to get some things that have really done well and some things that haven't. And the, the net net has been, it, it's kind of been this year unchanged to down 5%. You know what I mean? Like, like it's, it's kind of right there. But if you don't open the hood and say, okay, it's unchanged, but we got a bunch of stuff that's up 20% and a bunch of stuff that's down 30, you know, you, you really have to pay attention to, to the individual sectors too, is my point. Like the, the growth block gives it all to you. Yeah. If you're interested in specific REIT blocks, we also have that. So if you wanna just be in technology, you can just be in technology and just own data centers and towers. Um, you can just be in industrial, you can just be in residential, et cetera. And, and that's what we're trying to do through PATH is both give you total representation with our own active management, but also opportunities to participate in themes. Would you agree? 
Yeah, and, and, and that kind of, I think, answers one of the questions that we had come in via email was, was kind of about valuations. And it was basically, hey, aren't the data centers and the industrial REITs, you know, overvalued right now? I mean, if, if we, we look at the NAVs across REITs, they're, you know, basically trading across NAV, but there's some groups that are at massive discounts, such as malls and office, while others are trading at massive premiums to NAV, such as the data centers and the towers. But I don't, I'm not saying, I don't think that's a good uh, reason to go out and just load up on hotels and malls because you're going to have continued well, volatility. Whereas you get some COVID insurance with the data center, stability of, of, of cash flows, the same with industrial and demand. Again, years worth of demand is being, being pulled forward. So, I mean, that's where I would really, uh, you know, try and stress having a balanced portfolio of, of REITs, uh, unless you really want to own just one specific sector. Oh, you know, let us decide that we'll overweight certain sectors, but have exposure to some that are deep discounts, but also have exposures to some that have long-term secular growth drivers as well. Yeah, and what we're looking at is the demand function, supply, we're looking at the current price of the stock, we're looking at the efficacy of the management teams, and we do a deep dive there, and then we're looking at the balance sheet and the competitive analysis, and that's done REIT by REIT as we build out these blocks. Okay, I'm gonna move to Q&A, um, and uh, we can go into a deeper dive on those last four sectors, because I know that was a bit rushed, um, but we have a lot of questions. We actually have 10 questions. So, um, Jeff, this truly is a lightning round. We have seven minutes. Um, I need to ask the questions. You can answer them all, okay? Um, what is your opinion on EQR, equity residential? Start with that. Yeah, so, I mean, I, 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 it's, it's coming. I, I recognize that they're at a deep discount, you know, of the coastal REITs. I like Avalon Bay a little bit better. You know, EQR has some of these luxury high rises that are seeing less demand. Avalon does have the bigger development pipeline, and they do have the lower price point option with their AVA product. So I almost think that you can't go wrong with some of these residential REITs, but I would take AVB over EQR. All right. Starwood Hotels, STWD. Starwood Hotels. That's a C corporation. Now you're trying to throw a non-REIT at me here. Um, so I'm going to pass. It's not you don't a cover it. Fine. Um, I'll cover this. If interest rates rise, are you concerned with the impact on preferred equity? Um, no, I'm not, because I don't think interest rates are going to rise. Um, certainly not um, LIBOR for the next two years. Um, so I, I view that as a very remote uh, possibility. There's a lot um, of cushion in the spreads. Recall, as the interest rates come came down, these things typically would have gone through the roof. But in some cases, they sold off, meaning that spread widened. So there's a lot of cushion for that spread to compact before we start yeah. seeing prices uh, decline. And that's a really good point. Um, if you're not in industrial towers, data centers, or multifamily, your borrowing costs haven't gone down in real estate even though the risk rate rate's a lot lower. And that's what Jeff's saying. So they just haven't shown up because the lenders also don't want to lend to retail or office or hotels. It, it's, it's, they view it as a risky loan. Um, okay, when I make an investment into one of your REIT blocks, am I assigned actual shares of each of the stocks or is it more of a fluid NAV for the whole basket? And this is a great question. Please answer it. Yeah, no, this is the mechanics. So these are these would be described as separately managed accounts. When you invest in a block, it is a portfolio of stocks, but you own all the underlying shares. We have fractional shares so that if you put in $10,000, we can fully put that $10,000 to work. You might own 8.63 shares of this REIT. You might own 11.29 you know, shares of this REIT. You own all the underlying stocks. Yep. Um, any update on Simon Taubman M&A litigation? Do you think the deal will go through? Uh, I think it's on the docket for November. I'm terribly bad at handicapping the outcome of, of cases. I mean, there's a chance that they could come to a, a, some sort of settlement. Maybe Simon buys it for a reduced price. Uh, maybe Taubman lets them walk, walk away, but takes a large cash fee. 
or you could have the court saying, nope, you have to consummate the deal, or nope, Simon's right in terminating it. I mean, that, that's kind of your list of outcomes right there. Um, the tower reads seem to have lost momentum. How serious of an issue is the late T-Mobile demand? Yeah, so I mean, this is supposed to drive demand er early in the year, and, and I think all three of the tower reads did say, no, no, it, it, it is still coming. Obviously, you know, there were you know, shutdowns, slowdowns that happened in the, in the first half of the year. Uh, this is expected to, to continue and drive demand in, in the U.S. Uh, if I had any concerns, it would be more about some of the international businesses that some of the tower companies are. Now, granted, right now, uh, we have a, a relatively weak dollar, meaning that those international revenues are worth more. Uh, but in some places like India, you know, we expect there to be massive uh, carrier consolidation, uh, meaning that you know, less towers would be needed by any given carrier. So um, yeah, I, I think the T-Mobile Sprint, you know, that, that's gonna play out and we will see increased activity later this year or early 2021. I can answer this one. Uh, given the arbitrage opportunity in apartments, uh, apartment REITs that Dave mentioned is origin allocating capital in this direction. Um, shout out to this question. Thanks for, uh, thanks for joining in. This is actually one of my favorite ex team members at origin who now runs his own company. So shout out to you. Um, the answer is yes. Um, we are actively acquiring residential uh, apartment REIT positions for our income plus fund. And the reason is we view it as a, a better opportunity than common equity investments in um, residential right now. So what we're doing for that fund is we're very active in the preferred equity space on the private side. Um, we have um, literally six deals that are um, all gonna be coming down the pipeline there. Really interesting. Uh, but then we're also adding to the, our public uh, REIT positions there. Okay, um, I'd like to know about healthcare outpatient medical centers like Flagship, a private REIT. Well, yeah, so Flagship, you know, not a listed REIT, so I'm not, not going to cover it, but the medical office, uh, uh, those have actually held up, you know, relatively well. You know, again, as I mentioned earlier, there was a period where they couldn't do the, the elective surgeries, uh, but those are on, back, you know, back again. Those, those are doing well. Again, right, if there was any trouble in, in healthcare, it's in the senior housing and in the skilled nursing space. For the most part, the, the MOB, the outpatients and, and the hospitals are, are in much, much better position. Um, last question, and then we'll handle the ones that were sent prior um, to the webinar. What are your thoughts on store capital, considering that Warren Buffett has recently increased his overall holding? So we own store capital in, in, in our growth block. That is our, our net lease uh, uh, position. Um, you know, obviously, they had some uh, hiccups earlier in the year with the art ban uh, vacancy, uh, but you know, we actually stuck with them, and, and they've done quite well over, over the, you know, the past few uh, we, weeks or months, uh, if, if you will. So you know, we, we do have a favorable outlook on store capital. Okay, first question sent prior um, was... Hold on, I gotta pull it up. Here we go. Um, which REITs are overvalued based on Q2 earnings? I, I don't know if you answered, it's two questions. Are there any that jump out to you as something that based on what you heard and their current valuation you would shy away from? Well, and, and yeah, that's some of that I, I, I tried to you know touch on uh, uh, earlier. I mean, one, you can't use two quarter earnings alone because you can't extrapolate those numbers. And then you either fall in the have or, or, or the have nots, right? I mean, malls are the have nots, lodgings are the, are the have nots, uh, offices the have nots, whereas things like you know towers, timber and, and industrial, they have a much more favorable uh, uh, cost of capital. So I don't know if they were trying to get it you know, in, in, into this brief, if you download the Path by Origin uh, app, you can go in and you can see the, the holdings that we have in our growth block and you can see that, you know, the names that we, we like there. Then the last question, a uh, nice comment. He says, I really enjoyed Jeff's in-depth analysis, um, both on the webinars and the newsletters. This might be your mom, Jeff, I don't know. Um, <laughs> can he comment on some of his recent ads and drops? In particular, uh, the hotel read, SHO uh, was dropped, but um, 
RLI-A is still held. So let's start with that. Uh, yeah, so the Sunstone prefers, there is no Sunstone J series, and, and I'm not recalling that we ever own the Sunstone preferred. I mean, I would fully agree that Sunstone has a better uh, balance sheet. I mean, Sunstone has the best balance sheet of the hotel REITs. Uh, RLJ, we do own the Series A preferred uh, in our income block. Uh, RLJ is, uh, you know, has more of these compact uh, uh, service uh, hotels, uh, you know, versus some of the, the luxury. Um, RLJ stole a billion dollars of assets, um, you know, late last year, early this year, and has, has plenty of liquidity. You, you do get more yield on the RLJ than you would on, on the Sunstone. There's probably nothing wrong with the Sunstone, but it's a lower yield, uh, and there's not as much liquidity as the RLJs. Okay. Um, Dave, do, I to, do we have more yeah, questions, have, or do I have yeah, time I'm to share one quick slide? I'm just going to finish this. Um, retail reads, FRT-C was dropped but not KIM-M. Uh, yeah, I don't know what they mean by these drops and in, in, in ads. I mean, we, we didn't actively sell federal during the quarter. I don't think we've owned it uh, uh, this year. Um, so I, uh, I'm, I, I gotta be honest, I just don't fully understand that question. Maybe if they email in, we can reach out, you know, if we have their name, we can reach out to them individually. Any opinion on which one you like more? Uh, well, the Kimco is going to come with a higher yield. Um, you know, federal. I mean, it's almost the same thing as the Sunstone. I mean, I mean, federal credits is as good as gold, um, but you're probably talking a, a yield that starts with a four uh, versus Kimco that's probably in in the sixes. Kimco is good enough. It's a lot of grocery anchored, so I would take the six percent yield from Kimco. Okay, and last one, um, EPR dash G. Does their yeah. cash burn rate scare you? Yeah, I mean, it, it does, but you know, right, so they struck a deal with AMC, they're going to rework some of these leases, that's a that's a net positive for, for EPR. We need to get the movie theaters open, uh, we need to get the water parks open. Um, several of their experiential uh, real estate is, you know, just been opening the, the last quarter. Um, they're, they're definitely not running at uh, full capacity, but I do have faith that EPR will survive and that, you know, kids will go back to the water parks in the future and at some point, we will get to see movies uh, out. So I, I, I'm comfortable owning the preferred from EPR. Okay. So that's it. Um, we don't have more questions. We actually got a lot in. So I thought it was really productive, Jeff. Um, can I share? Time. Yeah, can, yeah. I, Dave, can I share a quick slide with everyone? What final point to drive home? Sure. All right. So if I can pull this up here. What we're showing here is, you know, we've heard a lot about, you know, REITs underperforming the, the S&P this year by, you know, 20, 25 percent, depending on uh, which, which index you use. So what we've done here is we've, we're, we're listing REIT versus S&P returns since the, the dawn of the modern REIT era in 1991, and we've highlighted which ones ha has done better. So there's a few things to point out. If we look at back during the, the uh, Great Recession, uh, 2007, 2008, when, when that occurred, you know, the S&P uh, did do better than the REITs through 2008. Uh, starting around March of 2009, the, the REITs took over and then led to multi-years of outperformance, four to be exact. Something that might be more similar to where we are today is actually the tech bubble run-up of, of the late 90s. 97, 98, 99, we all know what tech stocks were doing. Uh, valuations got out of control. And they outperformed REITs that just didn't, didn't participate in that tech run-up. But then when that bubble burst, right, and, you know, the S&P was down three years in a row, 2000, 2001, 2002, REITs actually went on a seven-year tear of outperforming the S&P. You can look at these numbers and see that, you know, some of these years were, were really big. This now, if this year stands, you know, this could be the fifth year in a row that the S&P outperforms REITs. So we've never seen this long of a stretch by the S&P. But this could imply, you know, given some of the stretch valuations on tech, that REITs are ready for a multi-years of outperforming uh, the S&P 500. If the S&P outperformed for five years, does that mean that the REITs will outperform for 10 years? Uh, I don't know, but it sure seems like we are set up for a multi-years uh, of REITs outperforming the S&P 500.
Yeah, that's interesting. We we probably should have put that at the beginning because it's so interesting, but this is in minute 66. So um, I appreciate everyone's time. Thanks for staying for, for, for an extra five minutes. Um, I'm going to run now to my next thing too. Thank you for your time, Jeff. And everyone, Dave, we'll, uh, we'll get through this together. Until next month.